Okay, um, let's look at how we program in C++ or in C. Uh, so the initial thing we're going to do is use a text editor that is within what we call an integrated development environment or an IDE within which we're going to write code which will be labeled as our source code then we will depending if we have any other library files to add to it uh, we will link them and compile the whole thing into an executable file which will be the application so at this stage I am in the IDE Dev C++ it's opened up and I'm gonna start a new file which will be our first program so I'm gonna go over here and say file new and you could say source file right here so I'm gonna click on that and I get this IDE where I can type whatever I want um, but that's not what I want to do well what what am I gonna do here I'm gonna write our first C++ program okay uh, so to do that you need uh, to write this program in a procedural manner so if you're reading your textbook you're reading about functions procedures you need at minimum one procedure or one function called main and typically its technical name is called uh, the controlling function so okay so how do you write main you do something like this main is a function you open a curly brace and you close curly brace that is the minimum requirement to have an actual function defined defined means I've already told it what it will do a function again is a job so it's supposed to do something and this is the minimal requirement actually to have a C or C++ program we will fix it up a little more than that uh, some uh, notice that main as a function notice the pattern and way way it's written you have these parentheses so anytime you see these parentheses you know it's a function some functions you might see things inside of it and those are called parameters okay and then you see curly braces you see an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace well what happens in between is what we call the function definition or what does the function do and that's where you write your main code here uh, for this function main now for this one if I actually save this file so let me go ahead and save it file save as and I'm gonna go ahead and tell it to save it to a directory and it will be my intro to programming I'm going to just save it in here and I'm gonna call it example one and notice that the default way the uh, compiler or the I'm sorry the IDE wants to save this is in .cpp keep it that way now if you want a C program then you will go to .c so we will keep it at .cpp I'm gonna hit save and here we are now will this run okay so the way to know if it's gonna run first of all let me show you what's going on in that directory so if I go to that directory here's example one right I have a source file okay and as you can see uh, it was created today at this time if my clock and uh, schedule is correct all right so now I'm gonna do one more extra step is I'm gonna compile this which means I'm gonna take this source code and create another file out of it that the computer can actually execute will be your application so I'm gonna to go to execute compile and there you have it so what I did here is I got a message that says it compiled there were no issues uh, and everything was fine there are no errors no warnings so I'm gonna close this now let's go back to that directory and see what happened as you can see now I have two files okay I have example one which is an application so if I double click on it it's just like a game or a, proce a word processor it's just like any other application notice this one is 16 kilobytes so it's a lot larger right than what we started with okay which is fine because this includes a lot of other uh, 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 bytes in it that the computer needs to run just the program that we just created even though our program does nothing so if I double click on it notice my screen just blinked it actually executed there was a process 
that the operating system handled and uh, terminated once it was over. So um, let me just minimize this for a second. So can I run it from here as well? Yes, you can. So you can actually run it from here. As you can see, it's just blinked. So is there a way to hold the screen and, and hold the process so it doesn't die off and so on and so forth? Yeah, and we get to see that later on, uh, depending how we want to control how the application runs at runtime. That means while the application is running. Right now, we're at the source code. So we want to do a few things here. This is a C++ program. I would like to be able to print to the screen some sort of a message maybe, right? So uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of programming uh, uh, that you've taken before where you've done Hello World, uh, if you've done it in C or in, uh, 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 or in Java or in uh, Python, you've had a print function somewhere, okay? So it's the same thing here, except to print to the screen, okay? we're going to need the help of an actual library file that we need to include in our program. So you must include IO stream. And notice we don't need a .h like in, in uh, legacy C. So I need IO stream as a library file that has functions in there for me and utilities that I could use to print to a screen. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, can we use it? Sure. So if you're going to do that, then you could use the keyword C out and you could uh, orient to it a string, right? Or redirect a string to it to print out to the string. Now, one more thing I'm going to do, and then we'll cover this extra line of code some other time. Once we understand uh, what um, uh, this means. So let me go ahead and do using. Which, which we call a namespace. So we will uh, worry about using namespace STD as far as what does it mean really in the future. So let me just compile here just to make sure that my code is good, as you can see. So for now, you at least need these two at minimum. Okay, so what can we do? Now I could do something like this, see out. Okay, uh, hello world. And then end the line, end L, actually like this, like this. Okay, so this means end line. So what it's doing is, it's think of it like streaming things. So it's going to stream this string over to C out. It's going to stream this uh, this indicator here that this line is done. Give it a new line. Now let's see how this behaves when I compile and execute. Now you can compile and run. You could compile simply and then run, okay? So it's up to you. I can compile and run all at once, okay? But notice that it actually ran, but I can't see it. It's too fast. So I need to do something to hold the screen, okay? There is a function where you can actually cooperate with the operating system to let you pause this instruction. So we're going to do this. Uh, it's, the function, by the way, is called system. And notice it's a function, right? So it has parentheses just like main. And we're going to call it pause. So that will be the argument or the parameter this function takes, which means if you are familiar with DOS, pause is a DOS command that holds the screen for you. And it will keep the prompt from not coming back until you press a key. OK? So this will be helpful here to hold the screen for us. So let's see how it works. So I'm going to go ahead and compile and run again. And there you have it. OK, so let me just go ahead and uh, make this one a little bigger. I think that's as big as it will do it here for my screen. Let's see if the layout. Uh, I think that's about as big as it will get it here. That's fine. But press any key to continue right here after hello world. Ah. <laughs> Hell world. Now, it, I recognize that this is 2020, so that probably is applicable. But let's fix it, and let's be hopeful that the remainder of 2020 will be a lot better than what we have witnessed so far. So to conclude this video, I'm going to add one more line of code here to let the operating system know this is the end of this function. Hey, 
you know, when a function ends, and we're going to talk about stacks later on, we're going to talk about how memory is managed and how the, uh, the, the processor is going to know we've reached the end of a stack properly and we've executed properly. You m want a function typically to return some sort of a value to say, hey, you know, I terminated fine. So what you need to do is you need to have main actually return an integer. So now notice the new syntax that I'm throwing in. So it is expected that main, when it finish execute, executing, it will return an integer. So have it return that integer. And notice zero is an actual flag that says everything finished properly. And again, in another lesson, we get to learn how to play with this. So we can handle errors through the operating systems, uh, special cases, that sort of thing. Notice for our program, it won't make major difference uh, from what we've seen previously. Now remember, I made some changes. So I'm gonna go ahead and compile and run. So compile and run. And there you have it. Notice now it says, hello world. Okay, so we're being a little optimistic. And press any key to continue is the way to go. Because I have a system pause there. Okay, excellent. So now if I do this, this is what happens. Now, just to show you one more thing again, uh, can I repeat functions like system pause? Yeah, that's the, the idea behind functions. You can re reuse them again. So let's see what, what, is the, what is the effect of using system pause twice or three times or four times. So again, you need to recompile and run it again to see or to, 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 to uh, notice the, uh, the difference between the this version and the previous version. So I'm going to go ahead and compile and run. And notice I have a system pause. I'm going to hit it again. And notice now again I have a system pause running, which gives an output of press any key to continue twice, right? So because I called that function twice, okay? So again, we're going to be seeing functions later on, right? What do they do? So we've seen two functions today. We've seen main and system, okay? Now, if you didn't have IO stream, what would happen? So let me just, uh, let me just put a comment on IO stream. Let me just compile here and see what happens. And I get an error for C out. Okay, so I hope everybody got the picture here. Now let's suppose I put a comment on using namespace std. So this is what I want you to do when you're done with this video and you read or replicate this code. Go ahead and experiment and see what happens if you miss a few things or you mess things up. So compile here. And notice the same thing. Now C out is out of, it's, it's totally undeclared. You need that namespace std in there to be able to use C out. Okay. All right, so uh, let's suppose you didn't have C out and you didn't have namespace STD. So this is the kind of things I want you to experiment. Will that have any effect on system pause? Okay, so compile and notice none whatsoever. So system pause, the function itself, system, was it defined under the IO stream library? Well, let's find out. And now let me compile and see if we get an error. And sure enough, so you cannot use the function system unless you have IO stream already included and linked to your application. Okay, so I hope this little exercise, right, helps you understand what is feasible right away, how to write your first C, C++ program, okay? And in particular here, I'm using C++ syntax. Uh, C works pretty much the same way at this, at this stage. Okay, so if I was writing this in C instead of IO stream, right, I would use another library like stdio.h, okay, uh, but the rest will be pretty much the same, okay, except I wouldn't use C out, I would use printf, but the system pause will still be, or system with the pause as an argument, uh, will still be valid in C as well in Windows. <laughs> so uh, again, this is okay in Windows. So because I'm in a Windows environment, even though I'm running my Windows machine as a virtual machine within my iMac, as you can see from the recording, okay? If I were to write this, if I were to write this in a Linux platform or by iMac, which is a Unix, Linux-based platform, this system pause will not work. So there will be other things or other ways to make the screen hold for you. Okay, so I hope this was helpful, okay? And let's hope the second half of 2020 works out really well for all of us, okay? And peace again. See you again. 
Okay, so um, this is what we've seen in the previous video. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to, do, to introduce you to the concept of a variable. So I'm gonna redo the same example you're seeing right now, and I'm going to use what we call a string variable. So that means a variable of type string to print this hello world uh, uh, using this technique. And then I'll expand that to other kinds of variables uh, that represent, for example, numbers, characters. And what I mean by numbers, that could be whole numbers, float numbers, right, real numbers. All right, so let's get started. So I'm gonna leave this one alone. We can leave this tab here and create a new one. So I can go ahead and say file, new, source file, and I'm gonna call this one example2.cpp. Now here's what I like to do sometimes is I like to write a comment at the top of the file, okay, with the actual file name. So this will be example2.cpp. .cpp will be the extension for this file, okay? So let's go ahead and save that file now. So I can go ahead and say save, and I wanna save it in the same directory where I have intro to programming, where we've seen example one. This will be example two. Now, I do not need to type .cpp here because the extension is right here, save as, so it will automatically do that for me, okay? So now I'm gonna have two source files, one example one, and the next one is example two, okay, for this lesson. So under example two, uh, I could also write a comment here that says, what do we wanna do with this file? So this is, again, called documentation. Uh, you know, suppose I have thousands of lines of code in this program. Uh, I would like at the beginning, at the intro, write some sort of an abstract or some sort of an intro that says, what is the objective of this source code? Uh, so when you compile it and you run it, you know what to expect out of it. Uh, this one will be um, introduce introduction to variables, okay? And I'm gonna keep them simple for this, vari for, this, uh, for this video. We're gonna look at variables. In the next video, I'm gonna look at variables again, but we're gonna look at them from a memory point of view. How does your computer see them? Okay, or, so let's start with the same typical program we had here. So we need to have the include IO stream. We need to have the using name STD, and we need to have the function main with the return zero at the, be at the, at the, bo at the bottom. So I'm gonna rewrite that again, okay? Uh, I could have copied and pasted, but I need you to go and rerun this video again and do it step by step as I type this. So initially what I want you to do is watch the whole video, stop when you're done and redo it, step line by line, okay? So I O stream, and if I make any mistakes, do make them so you can actually see how that mistake wor works for you, even though I'll describe later on how to fix it, okay? And notice the next line will be using namespace. And then I'm gonna need my int main. Now it's a function, so you need you need the these, uh, these parentheses, open and close parentheses. And then I need curly braces. And I need an open curly brace and a close curly brace. And inside, my last instruction will be return zero, okay? So at this stage, I'm ready to compile this program. Now, if I didn't have main, this program will not compile. To prove the point, let's suppose I did not have main. So I am going to uh, do this, do this, and do this. Let's say I had return, or not even return zero, here you go, right? And I try to uh, compile this program, right? So it's already saved. Uh, let's go ahead and save it again. Just, just You could see by saving it, nothing will happen. All right, so new news is good news. Now, what happens if you try to compile it, okay? You get an, a warning here, an error that says, there's no main in here, it's missing main. Okay, well, let's suppose I write int main and I forget to define it, and I compile it. Then I get an error. You have to define main. So let's say I define it without return zero. Now that would be fine, except it's expecting an integer at the end. So compile, okay? As you can see, it's fine but it's not correct. You need to complete this because it's expecting an integer as a return value that main will return back to the operating system. Basically, it's gonna return this zero value 
back to the operating system. What, what do I mean by that? When you run a program, what happens is the entry point to the program is right here. And the exit point will be right here. Okay? Fantastic. So now, let, let's get to the meat of our presentation for this video. I want to declare a variable of type string that I could actually type uh, something in it, right? So, hello world. So, can I do something like this? String, my greetings, Okay, so let's compile this for a second just to make sure this is not uh, a, a syntax error, which it, the compiler accepted it. All right, so it's, it is within the realm of the language for C++. And let's try to understand what I just did. What I have here, my greeting, is my actual variable. I could have named it anything I want. This is what I want to store in it. A string. Hello world. But since it's a variable, I must tell the computer or the operating system what kind of data is ex it, is, it is expected to store. What well, it's supposed to store a string. This is why the data type has to be written before the variable name. So data type, variable name, and then the value. Could I have done it like this? Semicolon. Notice. Every instruction ends with a semicolon. String my greeting. Great. So right now, I've declared a variable called my greeting, but I haven't put anything in it. Let me compile it, just show you. Everything is good. Now, can I assign a value to it later? Absolutely. My greeting equal hello world. So you don't have to initialize it. You could assign a value later on. So again, the first method that I used was called initialization. This here is called simply an assignment. So make sure you put your two quotes to finish up the string. So it's considered one chunk of data that is stored under my greeting. So let's compile this again. So I'm compiling to check for errors here. Now, if I try to run this, nothing will happen because I'm not doing anything with this. So if I run it, notice nothing happens. Now, by the way, it's probably a good idea to hit to write system and pause here and a semicolon to hold the screen. So let's see what that what happens with that. So I'm going to compile and run. And there you have it. So I have a, a press any key to continue. OK, now, great. So what it, I, I want to display this. Can I display it out to the screen? Sure, you can see how now remember we had hello world here. So we don't need this anymore. So we're going to use the variable itself, my greeting, and then end L. So notice the syntax here. I could use the variable name. Do not put two quotes around it. If you do, you're simply going to get my greeting as an output, not what's in it. OK, I'll make that mistake on purpose in a minute. So what did this replace? This compared to example one, replaced this line. So it is in lieu of putting the actual string on the stream right here. So now we can use a variable on the stream since it already has a value, right? So we're reading the content of the variable and displaying it to the screen. So let's compile and run and let's see if it does it. And sure enough, here's hello world. Okay, I'm surprised that I can't set the properties to make this a little bigger. I guess that's about as big as it will get here. Okay. I'll see later on if I can make some adjustments for the console to be a little bigger than what I have here, okay? All right, so what if I put two quotes here? Now that, if you do that, then this becomes what we call a string literal. This here is a string literal. It is not a variable. So again, what is a string literal? This hello world here in the example one, was a string literal, a string literal. So just in case you're, you're worried about how to, how to write it or how to spell it. But if you do this, watch what happens. So compile and run, then you get my greeting. So you get the variable name instead of the variable content. 
But that's not the intent. We want the variable to do its job. We want to be able to put something in it. Now, can I change the content of my greeting and type it again? Absolutely. That's why it's a variable. Variable means it can change. So I can say something like this, my greeting, and I can have, assign it a new value. Okay. I am fine. Right. So let's see how that works. Well, first of all, you need to print it out to see if indeed uh, the content of my greeting change. So see out. My greeting. And then end L to end the line. So now let's see how this works. So I'm going to compile and run. And as you can see, the first value for my greeting was hello world. The second value for my greeting is I am fine. Okay. All right. So what's the lesson out of this? Is that you can change the values stored in a variable. That's why they're called variables. Okay. Can we do this with numbers? The answer is absolutely. So uh, can we declare a variable that holds a number? Yeah. So you might be tempted to write number. No, don't do that in C++. So numbers come in different formats, right? So you have what we call integers, which are whole numbers. And even integers come in different flavors. You have long integer, short integer, okay? And then you have floats, which also have come in different flavors. You have floats, and then you have uh, double, okay? And then you have some variations of that. So um, let's do something with double, all right? So double, okay? And in the next videos, we're going to see how much memory space a double or a float or an int or a string occupies in memory, right? Right now, we just want to get the concept, what a variable is, how to manipulate it, and how to use it, okay? Uh, so let's say I call this one my num, okay? And that means, could I assign a value to it? Absolutely. Can I say my num equals nine, point one? Yeah, sure, why not? Because it's a real number. So double is a real number. It's not necessarily an integer, okay? So decimal point is a good idea. Even if it was nine, you would write 9.0 will be probably a good idea for you. Set some precision. Uh, so can I print it? Yes, you can print it anywhere you want after that. Uh, you could print it right in here if you want, okay? Or you print it by itself right here. So see out. My num, again, do not put my num between quotes, otherwise it will print simply my num and L. Now, let's see what we get out of that. So let me just make sure I don't make a mistake here with the syntax, let me compile and run. And there you have it. So hello world, I'm fine, 9.1. Now, can I combine all of this stuff into something a little more meaningful? Yeah, we could do that. So let me, uh, do an example where we're going to ask, where we're going to put a name, first name and last name, and age, right? So we're going to do something a little more meaningful than this, now that we've seen how this can be done. And we're going to use age as an integer. So I'm going to do example three. So I'm going to click here for a new source file. And I'm going to call this one example three dot cpp. And this one again, explore uh, variables in C++. Okay. Uh, so this is again, part two of our video series. Okay. So include IO stream using namespace STD. Now we're going to write a small app that will be a little more useful. Okay. And let's do a system pause here to hold our screen. Let's go ahead and do a return zero. Let's go over here and create a few strings. So one will be string first 
last. Now, what did I just do here? It's This is a list of variables of the same type. I want a variable called first and I want a variable called last of type string. You can do that. So you could do this or you could do this. Semicolon string last. So you could write them one at, one at a time or you could write them all in one line. I like the previous version that I had, so comma to separate them. Don't put a semicolon here, right? Because semicolon is the end of that specific instruction or that specific line. So comma basically means I have another item, which will be last, or you could say last name. So some people like to name their variables like this. First name, comma, last name. Some people like to name their variables like this. First name, comma, last name. Notice, always start with a lowercase for variables, okay? What you do in the middle is fine, semicolon. So I'll leave this one, right? I could have done first and last or first name, not last name, right? Okay, so I need you to consult your textbooks to find out what is the naming convention for these type of naming conventions for these variables, right? Right? Okay, you'll find them very interesting. So, ah, so I need something else for h, int h. Right, so now I can set values for these. So what I did here is what we call variable or variables declarations. So this is what we call the declaration block. Block means a block of code. So I need another block of code here. Assignment. Right? So this will be assignments. So what did I say declarations? Because I have each line is a declaration. Assignments is when you give values to things. So first name. And uh, 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 John. Last name. Glenn. I think it's two ends for Glenn. Yeah. And then semicolon. So there. How about age? Age. I don't know how old he is. I would say about 78, maybe. Maybe not. Let's suppose that was the case. So as you can see in this assignment block, I was able to give values to these variables. Oh, by the way, I need to save my file just in case a boo-boo happens, my computer freezes or something like that happens, you lose all the codes. So always a good idea to save your file before you get too involved. So example 3.cpp, so save. By the way, we can compile at this stage just to make sure we didn't make any mistakes or syntax errors. Even though if I try to run it, nothing will happen, by the way. Notice I have zero errors, zero warnings. So that means my syntax is correct for what I'm doing. So if I try to run this, as you can see, I will just get the press any key to continue because I haven't done anything with the console or print out to the console or print out to the video. So now, uh, typically in a C or C++ program, you'll have another block for processing. We're not doing that. I'm going to skip that one. And I'm going to have a, a, my final block. It will be for output. Now, the reason I wrote these blocks is this is typical to how you would write a program in C or anything within a single function like in main. Uh, so you can uh, start with something, give it values, process it. Like let's say you want to add two numbers and then I'll put the result afterward. So this would be a typical rhythm, if I should say, on how a typical program might work. So you have inputs to a system, right? But you need to define what these inputs are. That's what the declaration are for. Uh, the assignment is when you give values to these inputs. The system processes them, and then it will have an output or several outputs uh, to, to spit out the result of processing the values that you've just put in. The processing will be where your algorithm will be or whatever function this main function is supposed to be doing or, or the job. But in our case, we're not doing anything with processing. For this case, we're going straight to output, okay? 
And notice two slashes always means it's a comment, okay? So in my case, I am going to output, and I'm gonna make this one interesting. This is where streaming comes in handy. I could do something like this, name, and I'll put a slash n here. No, I'll just put uh, this, and I will attach first name to this. So first name, and then I will stream a space between them. Okay, so is everybody starting to get it here? This is a trick, neat little trick to format your output. So this is what the streaming to the console allows you to do. You can combine string literals with string variables. So last name. And then what I'm going to do here, instead of an endl, I'm going to do a slash n. A slash n is called an escape character. This allows me to get a hard return on the console, to give me a new line, basically. And notice I'm not going to put a semicolon here. I could, and if I do, I'll have to rewrite C out again to print the H. But this allows me to keep string, uh, streaming. So if you're going to do that, you can actually hit a hard return here, just for clarity, and put H here. And then stream that too, H. Now you can end all of this, end L, like this. This is the end of the line for the whole C out statement. Now let's see how this behaves. Now, now we can run this and see how it works. So compile and run. And there you have it. It's formatted the way I want it to. Okay. So name, John Glenn, enter, which is a, a hard return, right? That's your slash n. Then age goes on to the next line. So it, it actually prints a string literal, age and the equal sign. And then it prints the content of the variable 78. Fantastic. So for the next video, we're going to delve into a little deeper into these variables. We're going to see what really is going on with the computer. How is it storing these variables? Okay. And that's what we're going to learn about the stack, the heap, and memory locations. Great. I will see you then. Thanks again. So uh, as you can see, I pre uh, loaded this file already with some code uh, similar to what we've done before, uh, except at the top here, uh, instead of uh, two slashes like we had for each line of uh, comments like we have here, uh, what I have is a single slash with a star. And notice now all of these are considered uh, uh, a comment. Okay. And the way to end it is a slash star. So again, you start with a slash star and you end with a star slash, I'm sorry, okay? And all of this, all this whole block is called a block comment, okay? Uh, so unlike what you had here, good. So now let's get to what the objective of this lesson will be. This one here, we're gonna explore the various primitive data types that we use in C++. I've uh, listed the ones that I'm going to cover. Uh, that would be the short int, int, long int, long, long int. And these are the various flavors of integer uh, variable data types that you could create. Uh, same thing with floats. And floats comes in different flavors as well. Float, double, and long double. And then we have a, a couple particular ones, bool, which is for Boolean, right? So Boolean can be either true or false, okay? Uh, or zero or anything but zero. So if it's in any other value, it's considered kind of a one or true. If it's zero, it's false. Um, so it, it, bool is, you gotta be a little bit careful with that. We'll, uh, we'll pay attention to it in a minute. Uh, char on the other hand, okay? Uh, technically what it is, it's really an integer. Um, so if you have a textbook you can uh, for your programming course, uh, you can go to the back. There might be an, uh, an appendix for the ASCII code for all the characters, right? So each character will have an equivalent uh, um, integer value that represents it. Your computer does not understand what letter A or B by itself 
it associates a number with each one of your letters, either from your keyboard or from your files. Uh, all the letters uh, in the alphabet have an equivalent integer value, okay? Uh, can we look at it? Can we actually explore that? Sure, we can do that in this example. So let's hope I don't forget at the end uh, to, to peek into a character, let's say the uh, lowercase h, uh, what is its equivalent integer value. Uh, that would be an interesting little observation, okay? And then you can compare to your ASCII table just to make sure that indeed that was the result. Okay, so as we're going to be looking at these variables, we're going to see how we can use them, okay? Uh, in our next video, we're going to look at where and how much memory space they occupy, okay? So we're going to break down this lesson into two videos, and, 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 and so we'll have example five, for example, uh, .cpp, that will look at how memory is allocated for any of these variables. So at this stage, how do we declare and use any of these variables? Let's start with an integer, a simple int. So if you said int, okay, and let's call it num1, semicolon. What you've done here is you've declared a variable, num1, of type integer. Which means now in memory, what you can hold there are values that represent an integer number. Okay? So can we print what's in num1? Can we see what's in num1? Sure. Now here's, I'm going to do this mistake on purpose. Let's say I do this, C out. And let's say I say num1 equals num1 and L. Okay? Now, the compiler is not going to pick this as a mistake. Code-wise, this is correct. Syntax-wise, it is correct. Logically, it's flawed. And the reason it's flawed is because now you're looking at what's stored or what is num1 represent. Well, I didn't assign anything to it. I declared, so we declared a variable. So this was a variable declaration. And we didn't initialize it. We didn't give it any value, right? And so we just declared it. So it exists now in memory. Your computer knows about it, right? Or your process in, 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 in a way. And so let's see what, what this yields. If I compile and run this, let's see what we get. Aha, you get a value. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute. I've never assigned this value to num1. That is true. You didn't. Or I didn't. So where does this 16384 come from? That's garbage that was already in that memory location. Okay, now why is this flawed? Well, let's suppose num1 was supposed to be uh, a signal for an alarm, you know, so, you know, depending on what value it has, the alarm will do different things. Well, the fact that it has a value, it might get confused. So a lot of times, you know, if you're setting up an alarm system as an application, you may want to set it to zero to initialize it. So that means zero, you might consider it like don't do anything. One, uh, go ahead and set the buzzer off. Two, not just the buzzer off, lock all doors, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you, it depends on your application. But 16384 could confuse the whole computer and says, well, what the heck am I supposed to be doing with this? Or it could mean a specific thing, like blow up the whole building, okay? <laughs> so, and uh, you're an adventure, uh, you know, by mistake, uh, allow that to happen. Oops. All right, so we don't want that. So a lot of times if you're going to use it, there are a couple things you can do. You can assign a value to num1 before you print it or you initialize it. So instead of doing a variable declaration, can I do a variable initialization declaration and let's call it and initialization? And the answer is yes. So you could actually give it a value equals zero. Right, so right from the beginning, you're assigning zero as a value to num1. Now, let's see how this works. So compile and run. There you go. Okay, much better. 
Now, let's suppose I want to declare a num2 of type integer as well, but I will give it a value after I declare it. You could do that, and that simply is a declaration. So you could do something like this, int num2, semicolon, right? So this would be simply a variable declaration. And then you can give it an assignment later on down, 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 downstream. So num2 equals 9. And this here will be an assignment. So variable value assignment. Or you could say it's simply variable assignment. Right? So you've assigned value to a variable. Can we print what's in num2? So yes, you could do that. Uh, we could uh, put it in all in the same... Uh, we could do it right here if you want. So we could do something like this. Num2 equals. And this would be num2. You do something like this. We could combine it all into one statement. Uh, so compile and run. Let's see how this works. And there you have it. So num1 is 0 because you've initialized it to that value. Num2 is 9 because you've assigned that value after you've declared num2 by itself. Okay, so now this is valid. Okay, uh, again, in the next video, we're going to see where in memory are you storing any of this and how much memory you're taking up. Okay, so now let's go ahead and declare. So let me separate the program here. So I could put something like this. This will not have no effect on your program. So basically, this is really, it's the first two slashes that really de declare this whole line as a comment. So I like to do it that way to separate logically what I'm doing. So now what I'm going to do now is uh, go ahead and deal with um, a float type. All right. So a float type uh, would be something like this. So notice. Uh, I, I could spend some time here going through short int, long int, long, long int. We'll leave that for the next video when we try to figure out what really, why would we want to use long, long int or short int or long int versus just simply an int. Okay, right. So for now, let's simply go to the basic uh, uh, data types, int float, bool, and char, and then we'll get into the details of these, including how much memory space they occupy, okay? So that would make a lot more sense than if I did a short int example right now and not give you the context in which it lives. So we'll leave that for the next video. So right now we've seen what an int is. It's basically an integer variable, right? You can, uh, you can declare and initialize, or you could simply declare and then give it a value as an assignment and then print out. So for float, uh, let's call it num3, then let's say you wanted to store 7. The best way to do this is to write 7.0. You can write 7, but be clear that that's what you're doing. And what I have done here is I initialized it to 7.0. So this is a a declaration and an initialization to a value, right? So it is also a declaration, okay? But I've initialized it to a value 7.0, okay? Uh, can I do another one? Uh, sure, you could do something like this. Const float pi equal 3.14. Now, what did I just do? This also was an initialization, but I'm using the word const, which means now this is a constant. Could I have had a, also a constant integer? Absolutely. Okay. So you could use a constant, which means you cannot change it. So this is here is a constant. Let me spell this properly, constant. And let's see what does it mean when we have a constant. Constant, you always give it a value, which means, and notice here, the variable name, try to capitalize every letter of a variable name that is constant. You shouldn't use the word variable, or should you say 
a constant. Does that make sense? All right, so make sure you, you always capitalize this. Here, you could have a combination of, of uh, characters and numbers, but you always start with a lowercase, okay? I prefer all of my variables, if they're variables, to be all lowercase, okay? Uh, we get to see later on what are the appropriate uh, or formats that you could use for variables, okay? Uh, so for now, we're seeing a distinct com uh, comparison between simply a float and a constant float, okay? Uh, so if I want to change num3 to another value, that shouldn't be a problem to 8.23. And notice if I combine, I'm just going to compile this, just show you that the compiler will not complain about this. Okay, so everything is good. I have zero errors, zero warnings. So that's good news. Now let's suppose I go to pi and ch try to change it to 4.5. Now let's see what happens if I compile this. There you have it. I get an error, and it says assignment of read-only variable. So it's a read-only. You can't write to pi. What I try to do here is write to pi. It's a read-only, right, uh, variable. So you can't. It's a constant. You can't rewrite a new value for pi. So this protects pi from being altered. That's the whole idea behind it. So, uh, so if you wanted pi to use for, for example, uh, uh, some sine wave calculations or things of that nature, or a circle, the area of a circle or something like that, and you're actually using pi, you want to keep pi as a constant. So the concept of pi is not altered. Okay, uh, so great. So we can't do this. Can we print the num3 and pi. Yes. So see out num3 equals num3 and then pi equals I'm going to do the same thing and this would be pi and l. All right. Well, let's see how this works. So let me compile and run this time. And there you have it. So you're going to say, well, wait a minute. What happens to 7.0? We wrote over it. So another lesson we learned here is you can write over a variable, even if you have initialized it. Right? In the first example with the integers, we didn't write over num1, so we simply printed that zero that was already stored in num1. Okay? Num2, on the other hand, we declared it. And then we assigned a value to it. That wasn't a problem. So we did get our 9. But for num3, which is a float type, we've assigned it a value of 7.0. But that didn't matter because we wrote over it, right? But pi, on the other hand, since it's a constant, we weren't able to rewrite or change uh, that constant value. But can we use it? Absolutely. You can print it out, okay? And it's a read-only variable. Good. So now we've seen what a float allows us to store. So anything with a decimal point versus an integer, anything that is a whole number. But then at the same time, we've learned a little bit how to manipulate any of these two types of data types, right? An int and a float. And again, the next video, we'll get into a little more details. You know, what if I needed to store much larger numbers? And can we prove that actually the space allocated for any of those will be a much, much bigger or smaller to adjust the size? Okay, so, but for now, we're just following along. We're going to simply do int, float, bool, and char. So let's go ahead and do a bool now. Okay, so again, what I'm going to do now is put a whole bunch of lines here. And let's look at bool. All right, so for bool, and let's call it state. And let's make it equal to true, semicolon. Okay, so either a state is true or false or a variable name, whatever you want to call it. 
but this the the value is either going to be true or false now can we assign it integer values instead of true and false the answer is yes we'll, we'll see that in a second so let's see first what will this print so if you did something like this see out state equals now I want you to see this it's going to be interesting state and L all right so let's see what happens so let's compile and run and notice it does not write the word true it writes a one for us okay so now let's change the state to false so I'm going to do it right here and let's see what we get out of that so compile and run and notice you don't get the word false you get zero so one for true zero for false so it's really storing an integer okay so that integer is either zero or one okay I hope everybody got the picture here uh, so this false and true is really a label could I have written one here instead of true well let's see what happens so compile and run and sure enough I get the same result so one for true so you can actually put a one can we put a zero absolutely now I'm going to show you what else you can put in here so let's compile and run and you get a zero okay so now let's put a value other than one since it's an integer so you should be able to put five so what would the state be now notice I've made state equal five but it's boolean so compile and run and notice it changes state back to one okay even though we gave it a value of five as long as it's greater than zero then it will have a value of actually one okay so you could write the word true which is a keyword or the keyword false again which is a labeled keyword right or you can actually use integers so for a boolean variable as long as it's one or higher it's going to be true so now let's put a negative value let's put a minus one let's see what happens so compile and run and notice other than zero it still is a what a one so the only time it's false is when you put a zero any other value it's true okay so again let me put a false here let's see how this works compile and run okay so the only time you're going to get a zero is when you put false or zero for the state fantastic so now let's look at characters so char is the data type and my letter and that let's suppose we want to initialize it so to initialize it if you want to put a letter there let's look put a lowercase h notice this single quote not two quotes this is not a string this is a single character this was initialized to the letter h well let's see if we can print it out so see out okay and uh, my letter equals and then you could put my letter and up now let's see what we get out of that okay so compile and run and you get your h so it's as simple as that it is a variable you can actually change the value anytime downstream or any so uh, anytime you want to do any of this right so you want to change it to another letter you can all right so in our next video we will explore the various flavors of these data types and how much memory space they occupy okay fantastic so I'll see you then okay so for this example as promised prior to this we're going to look at how much or how many bytes does each variable occupy 
based on the type that you have assigned for that variable. Okay, so that's going to be important. And where in memory is that variable stored at? Okay, so now let's go ahead and start with a simple example of declaring a simple integer and then looking at two things about it. How many bytes that integer will need to be expressed, okay? And remember, a byte is eight bits, right? And so, and then after that, where in memory might that variable be stored at? Another concept that I want to talk about too is where did you declare this variable? Now remember, last example, we declared a variable within main, int, oops, int, uh, int num1 right here, right? So we've declared this variable here. So we know this is a declaration. So this is a variable declaration. I'm going to add one more concept. This is a local variable declaration. Local to what? Local to this function. Aha. So that means can we declare a variable outside of a function? What function? Main, right? So can we declare something outside of main? Absolutely. You could do something here. Int num2 semicolon. This here will be called a global variable. Now, that will have an importance later on in terms of why we would declare something global versus why we would declare something local. And it will have to do with the scope or the lifespan of a variable. So that's another attribute we need to discuss in the future in terms of, okay, we know the size, we know where it's stored in memory, but what is its lifespan? D does it live throughout while the program is running or does it only live while certain functions or within a certain function while that function stack is alive. And uh, so do we have different spaces in memory where we store this kind of variables, global variables, local variables? I mentioned the word stack, yes. So we're gonna learn about stacks and heaps as we move forward through these, uh, these lectures. Okay, so I'm not going to get into stacks and heaps yet, So, but just realize that you can declare something outside of a function, and you call it a global variable. And then you can declare something within a function and call it a local variable. Let's focus on that local variable, num1, and find out, for example, uh, how, how big is it? How many bytes does it occupy? Okay? And then where in memory is it? Can we actually print these attributes? Absolutely. You could do something like this. See out. The number of bytes needed for num1. And then you could use a function called size off. Now we didn't define this function ourselves. It's in the standard library, so it is for us to use. Size off, notice it's a keyword, and it takes a parameter, and within that parameter, it's a function, the actual parameter, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the parameter value is actually num1, okay? So that's, that will be the argument that it will take, and then end l. And uh, that should give you how many bytes this occupies. So let's compile and run this and see how many bytes num1 occupies. Now notice I didn't put any data in num1. Okay? All right? So compile and run. And there you have it. So the number of bytes needed for num1 is 4 bytes. Okay? Perfect. Can we see where in memory is it stored? Now, at this stage, it will randomly pick 
a memory location for it. But typically, it will be at the bottom of the heap. I mean, at the bottom of the uh, stack. But let's not worry about that. Later on, we'll learn how your uh, operating system and your uh, uh, computer and your application work together to allocate memory. But right now, we just want to know where in memory is it. So the address for, I would say, you know, to be technically correct, you should say the starting, ad, the starting address, not just the address, because it takes four bytes, okay? They're technically each byte has an address in RAM, okay? So that's typically how it works. Uh, so, um, but by saying the address of num1 is this is going to give us an address but to do this you can't just type num1 otherwise it will be the content of num1 you're going to do this and percent num1 so and percent num1 means the address of num1 okay well let's see if we do get an address typically an address okay will be uh, expressed in hexadecimal value as a hexadecimal value well let's see if that's true compile and run and sure enough, here he is. So we have 22 FF44. So this is the address where num1 is starts or stored, and then it takes four bytes from there from this number. Okay? All right. So, uh, and again, we're going to see in the future does it subtract four bytes from that number or does it add four bytes to that number? And again, that's a totally different lesson. Uh, that's when we get to understand how memory is organized. Right now, I'm just concentrating on these two. Now, if I was, if I try to do this, see out. Now we've seen this example. The content of num1, and you put num1 here, and l. Now, what would we get? we will get whatever garbage was in there. We've seen that from the previous example. So let's go ahead and run it. Compile and run. And sure enough, we get some random value, right, for num1. Let's see again what we just did here. We wanted to peek into what's in num1, stored at this memory location. And it took four bytes to store this number, okay? And that's, if you had to read it as a story, that's what it's telling you. The size of num1 is four bytes. This is the starting memory location where num1 is stored in RAM. And this is the content of what's in num1. Now, again, as I told you before, it's always a good idea to either, either initialize num1 or ask the user to put a value in it, or actually at compile time, put a value in that num1. So let's do a compile time assignment. So num1 equals minus two. We could do that. So num1 has a value of minus two. So this here is an assignment, right? And let's see if we get our minus two here, we should. Nothing else has, will change there except for the memory address might be randomly picked again. But we'll still need four bytes to store minus two. Now, is four bytes enough to store minus two? Yes, it's overkill. If let's say you're, you, you were dealing with numbers from one to 10 or something like that, then sometimes just a regular integer might be too big in terms of space to store just small numbers if you're counting from one to 10. So is there an alternative? Answer is yes, you could do what we call a short int. And let's do the same example now with a short int. So all I have to do is change this int into a short int. Now let's see if things will have changed. So I'm not gonna change anything here other than num1 now is a short int. Let's see what do we get. So compile and run. And notice now, for a short int, I only need two bytes. Okay? Two bytes to store a short int. Okay? 
And this is the address right here for the starting uh, for the starting byte of these two bytes that are, that are occupied in memory for reserved in memory to store the value minus two. Now somebody might say, is there something as a short short int? Now watch what happens when you compile this. And you get an error. So <laughs> so no, you're not gonna go into a short short int. All right, so leave it as short int. Let's recompile. Okay, so as you can see at the bottom it says duplicate short. That means it's part of it's not part of the lingo, it's not part of the language. Right? So compile and run. And now we're back in business. All right, so short int as low as you can go there, right? So short int means two bytes. So that's 16 bits if each byte is eight bits. Still, right, For but for modern computers, that's not a big deal, uh, you, you know. So if this was uh, um, a, a robot and you don't have a lot of space, short int is probably a good idea to go for. Uh, since your RAM chip might be a little too small, it's not, you know, you don't have the flexibility of a PC to upgrade your RAM even more, right? So just uh, simplistically speaking here. All right. I hope you got the idea here. Now, what if I went for a long int? How many bytes will that be? Let's go for a long int. Compile and run. Notice my long int is still four bytes. Now let's go for a long, long int. Long, long int. Let's compile this. Compile and run. And this time is eight bytes. Okay, to store that minus two. Okay, now remember this memory location is randomly assigned to this variable. So, But this is just a peek to see where in RAM, right, uh, is it stored at. Okay. Uh, all right, so what if we change num1 now to a float? Let's see what the, the effect of a float will be for us. Okay, so compile and run. And float is four bytes. Now with floats, you could have values like this, minus 2.5. And that shouldn't be a problem. Compile and run. Now if that was an integer, then it will truncate it. So if this was an int, so that means I am forcing a float into an int. Notice the compiler does not worry about it because what's going to happen, it, it gets truncated to a minus two. Okay? So what you've done here is you've basically typecasted into an integer. Right? So what if it was higher than 2.5? Let's say it was a 2.8. Let's see if it rounds it up or simply truncates. Compile and run. As you can see, it simply truncates. It doesn't round it up, so be careful with that concept. Okay, uh, and again, uh, if you did 0 .001, same deal. It will trunc truncate for you. So compile and run. Okay, to minus two. Okay, so if you had, for example, 0 .99, uh, 0 0.999, right? Let's see if it truncates to zero. Compile and run. And sure enough, it truncates to zero. That's before, because we forced a float number into an integer. Okay, so now let's put it back to float. So this should be handled by float, no problem. So compile and run. And that's not a problem at all. Now, what if I had a double? All right, so we're going to look at double now. Now remember your float was four bytes. Let's see how many bytes are for double. Compile and run. And now I have eight bytes, right? So what if I needed much, much larger numbers to handle? So the more bytes you have to express a number, 
the more bits you have to express that number, which means you can express higher numbers, right? Uh, especially in computations where you really need huge numbers. So what do we have? We have long double. So let's go ahead and do that and see if we get more bytes, which means more bits, right? And let's compile and run. And sure enough, I get 12 bytes reserved for long double. Okay, so I hope this helps you understand the different flavors here required for these. Now, great. So what if num1, let's say num1 was bool, right? And let's say num1 is true. Now let's see what a Boolean variable, what is its size and what is its content. Now it's true, we've seen that before, it's one, right? But let's see what, how big or how many bits are reserved for that Boolean variable. All right, so compile and run. And notice now it's one byte. That's all you need, one byte, right? Remember a simple int and a short int were two bytes. But now I only have one byte reserved for a Boolean. Okay? Right, so one byte is from 0 to 255, by the way, unsigned. So what if I went for a value of 345? Right? So what would happen? So compile and run. You would get a one. It's beyond the, the uh, so you have a, a one somewhere in that byte, right? So you're gonna get a one, which is true. Even though that number is expressed higher than a byte, but we're not looking at 345 as a value. We're just looking at the fact that there is a value stored in there. Okay, which means it's true. Great, so now, what about a char? So what if I had a char here, I could call it num1, but if it's a char, I'm gonna store now a character in there. And let's say the lowercase d is stored in there. Okay, so let's see how many bytes a char will need, okay? And as you can see, num1 will simply display the character that we have there. So compile and run. And notice also a character takes one byte, okay? Okay, so now that we've seen how variables are declared and also assigned values either at the beginning while they're declared, which we call initialization, or assigned later on, uh, you know, as we go down the program, uh, you can actually change the values of these variables, hence they're called variables. And we've also um, uh, seen a, a special kind of variable called a constant, right? So it's not really a variable, it's a constant, so it doesn't change value. You can't do anything about changing its value. Actually, your compiler will throw an error if you try to compile your code after you have attempted to change a value for a constant, okay? So your compiler itself will pick that up uh, before it actually issues any code that your machine can run. That's great. So now, how about interacting with your computer, which means what if the user wants to assign a value to these variables while the program is running? And this is why example six is what we're gonna call a runtime assignment for variables. Unlike the previous examples, those were compile time, okay? So that means you actually assign values in the code itself. Here, the scenario will be is that we don't know what the values are going to be. We will let the user assign those values while the program is running. Hence, we call it a runtime assignment for the variables. So, initially, the program is going to look pretty much the same as we've done before. You have to declare some variables, which means you are reserving memory space 
for these variables depending on their types. Then it's just a matter of letting the user through some sort of a message on the console to go ahead and assign a value to those variables. And then for giggles, we're just going to have go ahead and print it out to see what if indeed uh, it, the variable caught the uh, the values that we've assigned and we should be able to go back in memory and read those values that we assigned at runtime. So I'm going to start with a really simple example. We're going to use an integer, then we're going to do a float type number, and then we're going to do a character and see how this works for us. Okay, so let's start with a uh, Let's start with a character. Let, let, let's do that. So let's start backwards. So let's say I have a char. Oops, need to be here. Okay. So we have a char, uh, my letter. Okay. All right. So we have a variable of type character. So we know now from the previous examples that my letter takes one byte. Okay. And internally, it really is an integer that is one byte long. Okay. Uh, so if you look at the ASCII table for any of the uh, alphabet letters, uppercase and lowercase, all right, they don't need more than eight bits to represent them. Okay, so with eight bits, by the way, you have 256 combinations, right? So from zero to 255, if you have to write numbers or equivalent numbers in, bi uh, for, in decimal equivalent to the binary values for eight bits. All right, so, um, but in our case, we just right now have, by writing this, we are telling the computer, hey, reserve one byte for my variable, my letter. Now we're going to ask the user at this time, since I'm going to write a program that's interactive, I'm going to ask the user to enter a letter from the console while the program is running. So that is what the runtime assignment is about. So I'm going to do something like this. See out. Enter a letter. Any letter. And notice I'm putting a semicolon here instead of an end L. The reason is I want the prompt to blink right on the same line. So I don't need a new uh, a hard return. I want the, the, the actual prompt to blink that. So I need to bring the prompt on the console. And to do that, you use another uh, so this will be new. So if you've seen what C out prints to the screen, how about collecting data from the keyboard? C in. And notice the arrow is in this direction. Okay? Again, it's a stream. Can we collect more than one letter from, uh, from, the, uh, from the keyboard? Absolutely. We'll do an example like that later. But right now, I just need to control one letter at a time. So my letter. So let me spell it out exactly like I declared the variable. So what just happened? What happened is now my letter will have a value in it that was assigned during the running of the program. So in, in other words, it's going to wait the prompt is going to wait for you until you enter a letter. You hit enter, and then that value will be stored at my letter. Now, to prove that, we would like to see what did you store. So see out. You entered this letter. Now, it's a string, so I can actually put my letter right here. And then an end L, which means give me a hard return right there. So let's see how this works. Okay, so let's compile and run. So again, so let me just superimpose here so we can actually see line by line what's going on. So we are at C out, enter a letter. And it's prompting right here on the same line. Okay, so now I'm going to enter the letter D, lowercase, and hit enter. And there you go. You entered this letter, D, right? So we went back to that variable and saw what's in it or retrieved what was in it. Okay? So if we can do this with a character, we could do this with a number. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and declare another number here. So let's go ahead and do an int num1. And let's do the same thing right here. So we continue on. And we're going to do something like this. See out. Enter an integer. An integer is a whole number. So you, you know, so otherwise, if you entered, let's say, a float number here, it will truncate it if you're going to assign it to an integer, right? So, and we'll get to see that in a minute. So let, let, let's go ahead and make sure that we have the pattern working for us. So notice, just like letter, you need to interact with the user, send a message out, expect something to come back. So what's the variable name? It's called num1, so num1, okay? And then if you want, you can go ahead and print what was entered. So you entered this integer. And again, notice the pattern is pretty much the same. Oops. Yep, this integer. And this would be num1, okay, and l. Now let's see how this behaves. Let's compile and run. Okay, so it's asking me for the letter, which is what we've done before. All right, so we're going to let, uh, enter uppercase T. You entered this letter. Now it's asking me for an integer. So right here on this line. Okay, uh, we're going to enter 78. And sure enough, you entered this integer. Let's run this program again. And we could say simply run because it has been compiled. And uh, let's put a 7 as a letter. Can, can, is that possible? The answer is absolutely. Okay, so 7 does not have to be a number. It could be a character 7. Okay. All right, fantastic. So enter an integer. Now let's say I make a mistake, 6.6, .6, right? So let's see what happens. It will truncate it, right? So we're trying to force a float into an integer, right? So it will only look at the most significant digit, right? Uh, or digits if you're, you've entered more, and then it will truncate means what? Think of a scissor right where that dot is, and it will cut off anything on the right-hand side. That is what we call truncating, okay? Uh, let's do it again with a larger number. Now, let's say, let's run this. Let's let's make a big boo-boo, and this is, you know, typical. Let's say you entered several letters, E-R, okay? Now, watch what happens. So, as you can see, your program jumps because it was expecting a single letter, but it sees the R, right? And it will interpret that as some sort of a value you were trying to enter. Okay? So, and it got all mixed up, but you never assigned it, that R, to num1, right? So, so what's going to happen, it's, it's going to pull just garbage for num1 for 2. So this is important to realize that for characters, you can only enter one character at a time. Don't try to enter 2 or 3 or 4. That's a string. So you're going to need some sort of another tool or another data type to handle that sort of thing. Okay. But notice it picked up on the first one, but then your program kept running. Right? So there is an issue with characters or, or, or collecting characters uh, in case you don't pay attention and you put more than one character in there, okay? Uh, later on, we can tighten up programs of this nature uh, when we learn about loops and error handling and so on and so forth uh, to eliminate the possibility of the program running over other code because it kept it kept going like in this case. So I'm showing you the issues you can run into. So you have to be really, really careful. So if it says enter a letter, just enter a letter. Don't run, enter two or three or four. You're going to run into problems uh, of this nature. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's run this program again and let's enter. Now let's, let's uh, behave <laughs> and enter one letter. Okay. So I'm going to enter the uppercase P, okay? Uh, so it, it accepts that. That's no problem. 
uh, an integer value will be uh, 345.23. And again, 345 is not a problem, but it will truncate your point 23. Okay? So if you were, let's say, doing a physics experiment or a chemical experiment and you're collecting data and that point 23 is important, then this is the wrong data type to use to collect data. So you're going to need a float. And let's go ahead and do that. So we need a float. Uh, so we could do a simply a float if you want. And we would call it num2. Okay, and a lot of C++ programmers, they just go for double, right? We, we've seen uh, uh, float, double, long double, right? So let's, let's look at the float again. And again, it's a, a, a primitive data type. Let's see if we could use it. So we're going to do something like very similar to what we just did here. So I'm just going to copy and paste this and just change the wording a little bit, right? So I'm going to copy this and paste it here and uh, put num2 here, and we're entering a float. And you entered this float, and we can conclude our program for this video right now. And this would be num2, and let's see how this behaves, okay? So now we have a float, and we should get back our decimal point if needs be, if, if, you're, if you have some precision uh, going on in there. So let's go ahead and compile and run. So we have our letter E. Let's say our integer value is 6. And let's say our float number, right, is 7.89. And sure enough, that works. So I hope this was helpful. Uh, in our next video, we'll investigate even more uh, interactive programming with the console as we're doing here. Uh, and we're going to do some interesting things, maybe some processing, like, for example, adding numbers, subtracting numbers. So we'll I'll get to introduce you a little bit to how to do some basic arithmetics, okay?